to today's topic, which is Medicare compliance. Now, most carriers are going to require that uh, you complete an assessment uh, to become appointed. You know, that's going to be the retraining, uh, learning about their various products, and some uh, compliance uh, before they will appoint you. Now, just remember that these guidelines from compliance are really to help steer the aggressive sales tactics out of Medicare. Um, you're trying to get away from that, uh, you know, forcing somebody to do something right away where they, uh, you know, don't give them a chance to think about it and uh, uh, that sort of thing. When it comes right down to it, it's doing the right things for your clients, not for your own self-interest. Medicare has done a lot through CMS to take that out of the equation, uh, regardless of whose Medicare Advantage or uh, prescription drug plan you sell. The commission is the same, all trying to encourage that we do everything correctly and that we put the client's interests first. Uh, before your own. Now, we're going to find that there are uh, major complaints that happen constantly with Medicare, and we're seeing the same thing year after year. Uh, I always looked at it as I didn't know I was enrolling, my doctor isn't in network, and my drugs are not covered. Those are the uh, big complaints. So what we're going to look at through uh, compliance selling to be able to avoid that. We're preparing for the uh, annual Medicare kickoff here for AEP. Remember that on the 1st of October, all the plans uh, for 2023 become available for viewing. So we can actually talk to our customers, tell them about a new plan that's available. Uh, are becoming available. But remember, you cannot submit or accept an application prior to the 15th. So they have two weeks that they can look at them and two weeks that we can talk about them. But during that two weeks, we cannot enroll or accept uh, an application from a customer. And the way that the enrollment works is it's going to run between October 15th and December 7th. And regardless of how many enrollments a particular customer does, the last one um, will become effective on January 1st of 2023. So it all begins with being ready to sell. This means that uh, You've done all your Medicare and compliance training. You've done your AHIP training, uh, various uh, names that we see here, you know, show up uh, throughout the, the AHIP and uh, the various carriers training so that you have a pretty good understanding of just, uh, you know, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And for 2023, your product training will come from each individual carrier. So they'll all have, um, you know, their HMO uh, so that you'll uh, understand how theirs work, how their PPOs work, how their prescription drug plans work. If they do have special needs plans, it'll go into those. And then there's some specialized training like United Healthcare. If you want to do events for United Healthcare, sales events, uh, the, mostly the informal uh, type events such as manning a booth in the mall or a drugstore, uh, where you're going to be representing United Healthcare, all kinds of rules that go with that, and that you'd be tested and you have to be certified uh, to uh, do that. For United Healthcare. Very worthwhile. I did it one year. Spent about four hours once a week 
uh, manning a kiosk in the mall, answering questions for people that typically through that open enrollment, that effort alone uh, was to about 10 enrollments uh, during the open enrollment. And then it also led to another couple uh, by handing out cards to people who are aging in during the year. Uh, so those were all great opportunities also. But in order to do that, you have to pass the events test from United Healthcare. So you have to be licensed, appointed, and certified in every state in which you intend to sell. And not only that, maybe you don't want to sell anymore, but you want to collect residuals from your past effort. You still need to be licensed, appointed, and certified in every state that you have uh, uh, people that are going to be, that you want to collect the residuals from. So there's never going to be the opportunity to sit back and do nothing. You know, this is the way this year uh, that uh, Ready to Sell from Aetna appears. So you can see uh, the purple is uh, for 2023, all the states that I am licensed in. And then I selected Oregon, that's my resident state. And you can see that I'm licensed, appointed, and ready to sell MAPD and Part D plans. Okay, so this is the way that it looks like uh, from Aetna. Humana, on the other hand, sends out an email uh, notifying you, um, and there's an enclosure that will show all the uh, states uh, that you're allowed to sell and what you're allowed to sell there. Uh, for United Healthcare, this was last year's, and you see that I was qualified for events, I was qualified for uh, uh, you know SNPs. And then uh, Medicare Advantage prescription drug and the AARP Medicare supplement. So that was uh, the way it dis uh, it shows. Uh, but you have to go uh, and look at your uh, profile uh, to see, or excuse me, licenses and appointments to see uh, what states you're uh, ready to sell in. Okay. So United looks a little different on. Uh, you have to uh, dig into that to, to find it. Uh, other carriers will have something similar that uh, shows you what you're allowed to do. So one of the things that we need to make sure is that our uh, person that we're trying to uh, enroll um, is eligible, but I can do it, right? So that means I need to have had a signed scope of appointment. Okay. Uh, I verified that they're entitled to Medicare Part A and enrolled in Part B. Um, if it's a PDP, it's either entitled to Medicare or enrolled in Part B. They don't have to have both, but for the Advantage plan, they have to have both of them. And they have to live in the service area. I also need to inform them that they must continue to pay their Part B premium uh, unless it's paid by a third party like the state and people that are on Medicaid. Yeah, what I always encourage everyone to be able to do is to um, process a scope of appointment while talking to somebody on the telephone at the same time. So uh, all the various carriers and then some of the systems like such as Sunfire uh, where you can have an enrollment platform will also have the ability to text or email a scope of appointment and get it signed. I encourage everyone to uh, work at that, uh, keep sending it to yourself maybe, uh, to be able to uh, talk on the phone and uh, complete that scope of appointment and send it out to them. Um, remember, a scope of appointment is required in order to present and enroll. Okay. If you get the, the phone call 
where uh, you've maybe you've been working with them, maybe you haven't, uh, but they've contacted you and uh, they've got questions about a plan or they've got questions about Medicare or they've got general questions about, you know, uh, or it could even be a specific question to a plan. Um, I can answer those questions, but I want you to be to know that before I can shift from answering questions to presenting and enrolling, I need that scope of appointment. So that's why I want you to know how to do that while talking on the phone with a, a customer. That way, um, when you feel that uh, discussion uh, moving beyond just asking questions about Medicare or asking questions about a particular plan to presenting the plan and enrolling the customer. Okay? So you want to be able to do that, and that's going to require that signed scope of appointment. So learn how to do that uh, on the fly while talking on the phone. It's not hard, and it's uh, not a whole lot of tasks. I mean, you're going to be having to ask them questions as you're doing that anyway, like name, birth date, phone number, and as much information as you can get for the scope of appointment. So that scope of appointment is actually an agreement between you and your client as to uh, what products and coverages that you're going to discuss. It's uh, supposed to protect the customer uh, from solicitation. In other words, uh, I can't start soliciting a sale until I've got a scope of appointment from the person, right? And I can't bring up products that uh, were not on the scope of appointment. And part of that is, uh, and I'll show you a sample scope of appointment here, is what I always recommend is that you mark all the blocks. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, standalone drug plans, advantage plans, dental vision and hearing products, hospital indemnity, and Medicare supplement. Because in order to do a thorough job of uh, assessing what the person needs and wants, I need to be able to discuss all of those different uh, products. And uh, if you're ever challenged on why you mark them all, it's a simple uh, response. If um, you, all you want to talk about is a Medicare Advantage plan, and then you ask me a question about drug plans, we have to return to doing a new scope of appointment to include drug plans. This way we can talk about anything and uh, you'll be covered. And so this is uh, the other thing to know is that it makes no difference whose scope of appointment you use. It must be a current CMS approved scope of appointment, but there's no reason that you couldn't uh, be using, you know, Humana's scope of appointment and selling an Aetna plan, okay, or vice versa. I would probably be doing Aetna because I like uh, their uh, uh, platform for sending out the scope of appointment. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, it, in fact, before I started using uh, some of the uh, ones from uh, Sunfire, I used uh, Aetna's uh, Silver Script scope of appointment because it, it was uh, easy to do while talking on the phone. And I could either text or email. You know, it's just a simple process. And then uh, once they've signed it, you can download a copy for your record. So just, uh, like I said, be very comfortable with uh, what information you need and uh, how to uh, do this while talking on the phone. I just can't stress that enough. Again, here's the three biggest complaints. I kind of alluded to them earlier. You see, these are from 2021. Uh, top one is I did not consent to enroll in the plan. That's just a version of, I didn't know I was enrolling. Um, this led about the providers that were in the network. Uh, 
had the enrollment, disenrollment issues. Typically, it's that late enrollment penalty. Um, you didn't uh, uh, discuss it to somebody who was enrolling in a plan. Um, and maybe you, you, know, you didn't know that they didn't have one uh, in the past, but you never even mentioned that it was possible that it would be there. Okay. Uh, enrolled them in the wrong plan use deceptive tactics. And this is one that um, I have found myself, uh, uh, you know, doing, but you have to be very careful with this. I've had a many a call that initiated with looking for dental. And I, uh, you know, steered away from dental alone and into the Medicare Advantage plan. So you just need to be very careful with that in that if uh, they didn't understand they were enrolling in an Advantage plan and thought they were just enrolling in a dental or vision plan, uh, that's how you get in trouble. So you want to make sure uh, that they know exactly what it is. And I always top that off with, uh, I want them to call me if they have a problem. I just uh, can't emphasize that enough. I always want my customers to call me first. Many times I'm simply going to, um, you know, take them right to customer service of the carrier, you know, on the phone and transfer them there. But I always want first crack because uh, I want to be able to reiterate things that we discussed during the enrollment, just in case. Okay. If uh, you know they call me up and they're saying uh, uh, I want out of this plan, my doctor doesn't accept it. You know, back in October when we did the enrollment and we made the checks, saw the latest information, had that doctor as part of the network, and here we are in January or February, and now they're visiting the doctor and the doctor's not in the network. I want them to be calling me because I'll simply enroll them now into a plan that has that doctor in network. That's typically what would have happened is the, uh, they'll find out that uh, that group uh, decided not to accept that particular plan anymore. Maybe it was an HMO and all they want to do is the PPO uh, or something like that. So we want to be sure that we're the ones that get the opportunity to make that change for them. And I don't want it to go into, uh, you know, right into customer service because customer service will start off with something like, well, didn't your uh, uh, agent, uh, you know, look them up and do that for you? Or, and I don't want them to be steering the customer into making a complaint because customer service, even though it sounds like and that, that they're there to help the customer, their primary job is to protect the company. So they're there to protect the carrier. And the first thing they will do is say, uh, ask if they were informed by the agent about that. And uh, if not, they'll steer them into a complaint so that they're not complaining about the carrier, they're complaining about you, the agent. So this is uh, talking a lot about how to protect yourself. And so, by them calling you first, you can remind them that, yes, we looked that doctor up. They must have changed after the first of the year. Let's just find us a new plan that the doctor is taking now and, uh, you know, and then do the enrollment over again. Okay, so here's what we're going to do for every time we put somebody into a Medicare Advantage plan. Looks like a lot, but I want you to understand that this is how you stay out of trouble. It's when a cost that they didn't expect shows up that the customer becomes dissatisfied. Or when something uh, that you didn't do uh, for your customer that, uh, that you should have that is going to uh, upset them. So we always start off with that first one. I didn't know I was enrolling. Make it clear that this is an enrollment. 
when presenting, use that product's full name. We are enrolling in the AARP Medicare Advantage Choice PPO H2228-029-0001. So that way there is literally no doubt. It's the very first statement that you make as you begin the application. We are enrolling in the full name of the plan. Okay. And then, uh, then when we hear it, uh, the next thing we need to make sure that they understand is the star rating of the plan. Now, when you reference star ratings, I believe the best way to go about it is only use the overall rating to the plan. I want to avoid any misunderstanding of what the categories, uh, you know, that they could have received even higher ratings in. This is a four and a half star plan that got a five star rating in customer service, can sidetrack the customer into, even though that was a legal statement and fully true statement, it can mislead the customer into thinking they're enrolling in a five star plan. My method is to simply give them the overall rating and then refer them to the enrollment guide where uh, there's a breakdown of all the areas the plan was measured in and you can see there how it uh, weighed you know what it got but uh, i only like to use the overall rating and just stay clear uh, stating any other uh, numbers to, that could uh, lead to a misunderstanding on the part of the customer explain those eligibility requirements you are eligible because you live in the service area. You are enrolled in Part A and Part B of Medicare. And let me remind you that you need to continue to make your Part B payment, unless, of course, it's being provided for by a, a third party like Medicaid. But you just want to make sure that you state all of those things. You want to explain that this is that, a, that it's an enrollment. And that's what the disenrollment period is. Okay, here it is, you know, October 15th. I'm enrolling you in that uh, Medicare Advantage plan. And if uh, you want to disenroll, please contact me. Okay, this plan will go into effect on 1 January. You should receive all of your, uh, your cards and materials um, by late December. So that it'll be that you'll have you know your uh, new card in hand uh, come January, uh, but if you uh, find out for any reason that you want to disenroll with this plan, contact me. Okay, again, I can't disenroll them. I'm going to have to get them over to the carrier for that. But I want that first crack at saving my sale. In other words, I'm not going to try to talk them out of disenrolling. I want to know why are they disenrolling? Is it because that uh, doctor wasn't in the network? Well, let me put you in the plan that has the doctor in the network, because I can easily under the, uh, you know, now we're into Medicare open and MA open enrollment. And so I can uh, do that new enrollment to put them in the right plan. The scenario that happens a lot is that back in October, we look everything up. Come January, that doctor's group has changed carriers, changed to uh, plans that they accept. Maybe they no longer take the HMO and now they only take the PPO. But you want to be the one uh, that is now able to make that change for them and save your sale and save your commission and save the customer for all those residuals later on. The next thing you're going to do is pull out that summary of benefits. And you are literally going to review every one of them with the customer. It's going to start off with the premium. Okay, on this plan, the premium is zero. Or the premium is $35. I mean, whatever it is, right? Uh, you're going to discuss every item on there. And the where's the what I like to do is the next item uh, on that uh, summary is going to be a deductible if it has one. 
And um, if it's not the deductible, the next one the after deductible is cost if hospitalized. So it'll say something like uh, for hospitalization, it's $450 a day for days one through three, and then is zero for days beyond that. At that point, because back on that scope of appointment, I put hospital indemnity plans, I'm going to ask the question, would you uh, be prepared to pay that? Or would you like to know how we can get someone else to pay that for you? I haven't had anybody yet, uh, not, not, not that they didn't always buy the plan, but I haven't had anybody yet that said, uh, oh no, don't tell me how somebody else can pay it for me. That's just never happened. And so um, as I continue down through that scope, uh, through that uh, summary of benefits, uh, it's, you know, primary care physician is zero. Uh, if I'm dealing with a, a PPO plan, I would be like, you know, if I see, you see a specialist, it's $25. But if it, that specialist is out of network, it will be $60. Okay, so that they understand the in and out of network portions. And then when I get down to, uh, you know, uh, the skilled nursing facility, it's usually going to read something along the lines of it's zero for days 20, uh, one, or zero, zero dollars for days one through uh, 20. And on day 21 through day 59, it's $194. And then on day uh, 59 through 100, it's zero. And I'm going to tell them, and that's because you have reached your max out of pocket. Now that 194 a day, again, I can show you how we can get someone else to pay this for you. And I've just reinforced again that we're going to be looking at the hospital indemnity plans you know, following the enrollment. But I'll go through every item on that uh, summary of benefits to make sure that they understand what the cost is. Because if they don't, that's when the complaint arises comes comes up later. The next thing we're going to do, uh, well, we've already done this prior to the enrollment, uh, but we're going to look up all their doctors and we're going to make sure that the doctors are in this plan. Not that uh, their doctor accepts that carrier, but they've got to go that step further. Not only do they accept Aetna, but they accept this Aetna plan. I don't know how many times I've had the customer say, well, I was in the United Healthcare group plan when I was working, so I know that the doctor takes United. Well, that doctor doesn't necessarily take the HMO or doesn't necessarily take the PPO plan. I mean, we know that they took the group plan, but that doesn't mean that they take any of the Medicare plans. So if you want to actually look up that provider uh, and check it for that plan and make sure that that's uh, and that's not just the primary that will be any specialist uh, because you want to be able to tell them if any of those doctors are not part of the plan or if um, you know in the case of a PPO you can still see that doctor but that doctor is going to be out of network and I uh, I've told you about that uh, the fee for out of network so if you want to make sure that they understand that. We want to know all of those uh, network limitations. And just like in the under 65, that HMO is going to work the same. If you want to go to a specialist, I have to go through my gatekeeper primary care physician and get a referral to the specialist. Now, there are some HMOs. Uh, that uh, don't require that. And you'll see the HMO POS point of service uh, that will allow you to see an in-network specialist without a referral. But make sure that they fully understand that that doctor that is out of network is on their dime, uh, not going to be covered by the, uh, by the plan in that HMO. I usually like to uh, drive that home with a story. And I use, uh, like, if you uh, take your grandkids to Disneyland, and while you're there, 
you trip and fall and break your arm. Well, you're covered for the emergency room, and they're going to take you to the emergency room. You'll have a, whatever that is, a $90 copay, and they'll you know, take you in, they'll you know, do the x-ray, they'll set the bone, they'll send you, you know, put a cast on it. But that doctor may tell you something like, I need you to come back here in two days uh, and let me check this. And I want you to know that you're no longer in the emergency. That HMO may not cover that. So when the doctor told you that, you should always respond with, can this wait till I get home? I'm here uh, on vacation, and this will be out of network for me. And they would typically tell you that unless there was something out of the ordinary going on, that's fine. Just check in with your primary care as soon as you get home. But uh, that's how that emergency coverage works. And when that emergency is over and you're in that HMO and you see that doctor, it's no longer going to be covered by the insurance company. So you want to make sure that they understand and you want to make sure that they understand that they're in a Medicare Advantage plan. And that is different from a Medigap plan. Okay, um, when it's a, uh, you, you want to know specifically what it is, because when you use the term Medicare supplement, the customer literally classifies everything as a supplement. A Medigap plan, a Medicare Advantage plan, a hospital indemnity plan, a standalone prescription drug plan, those are all supplements to their Medicare. And you just want to make sure that they understand that they're in a, net, a Medicare Advantage plan. So don't uh, let that confuse your customers. Now, if we're dealing with Part D, like uh, that could be a standalone plan, or it could be part of a Medicare Advantage plan. I always like to make sure that the customer understands that uh, how their Part D works. And it's that MAPD, that, that uh, plan that had no deductible and had that maximum out of pocket, that did not carry over to the drug portion of the plan. That drug plan can still have a deductible, and it will never have a max out of pocket. It only uh, you, know, you would only transition over to catastrophic coverage. Okay? The max out of pocket that you see on the Medicare Advantage plan does not pertain to the Part D portion. So when it comes to that deductible, also want to make sure that it's a uh, uh, well, the maximum that they can charge for 2023 is 505, but many plans will be far less than that, and many more plans will have something that says something along the lines of zero deductible for tiers one, two, and three, uh, $400, $300 for tiers four and five. So that takes us into the tiers, and we're going to make sure that they understand because we are going to look up all of their drugs so that they'll know uh, what tier it falls into. Okay, Medicare itself only calls out three tiers as a minimum. Most plans these days have uh, five to six tiers. So tier one typically is the preferred generic drug. Tier two, non, uh, or not non-preferred, but simply generic drugs, but they're not on the preferred list. Tier three, name brand drugs that are on the preferred list. Tier four, non-preferred drugs, could be generic or name brand. Tier five, uh, specialty drugs, and you're going to go over the cost of all of those. And the way that that typically is, tiers one and two, uh, many plans, if you put them, uh, those are typically going to be all of your maintenance drugs, and uh, they would be zero cost if you put on mail order. So, uh, you could, and not subject to the deductible on most plans. 
not every plan, but on most of them. And so you want to be sure that you cover that uh, with your customer. Uh, tier three typically is going to be a co-payment, depending on the plan, between about $30 and $40. Tier four, again, these are the non-preferred, could either be the price of the drug or $100. Uh, if it's less than $100, it's typically going to be the price of the drug. Then uh, tier five, uh, uh, the specialties, uh, the common is about 35% co-insurance. Okay, so it's a percentage rather than a flat copay. So we want to make sure that they understand that. Okay? If it has a tier six, that's going to talk about how that drug is covered in the gap. We'll see uh, many plans these days have insulin in tier six. So that if you're in the coverage back uh, gap, they're still doing simply a copay. So uh, remember that in the, uh, the coverage gap, um, the uh, model calls out 25% of the cost of the drug, whether it's a uh, generic or uh, a name brand. Now the formularies, uh, we wanna make sure that people understand how those work and when we look our prescriptions up in the formulary, uh, the way that uh, CMS wants us to word that, uh, if you simply ask, what drugs do you take? You're getting into the world of uh, asking health questions, which is specifically forbidden by CMS, unless you're looking to put them into a SNP of some sort, like a C-SNP. So the way CMS uh, and most of the carriers will want us to question their drugs is, would you like me to look up uh, whether or not your drug is covered by this plan's formulary? So it's a uh, much more gentler and uh, it doesn't violate their privacy. So they are then uh, going to have, you know, give you the names of the drugs that they take and you can look them up in the formulary and see if they're there. We're going to discuss the benefits of using a network pharmacy. Usually you'll find uh, that the networks will have preferred and uh, standard pharmacies. You'll always get the best pricing in a preferred pharmacy. And then uh, if they're forced to use an out of network pharmacy, they can still fill the prescription, uh, but they can expect to pay more. And it won't be as covered as well as it uh, is in the network pharmacy. When we look those prescriptions up, we're going to uh, look specifically to see if there are any restrictions or cost control measures assigned to that prescription. And that is uh, things like prior authorization, step therapy, and quantity limits. Um, those will have just the initials uh, next to the tier that the drug is covered under. It would say PA for prior authorization, ST for step therapy, and QL for quantity limits. So you need to make sure the customer understands this. Uh, for uh, prior authorization, I understand that the doctor or the pharmacist uh, filling the prescription has to get permission from the insurance carrier to fill the prescription. So typically that's going to be just a computer to computer, but sometimes it's a, you know, it takes up to 24 hours to get a response back. So I always like to make sure my customers know that if there's a PA on there, don't wait till you've taken the last pill in the bottle because you may not be able to get it filled quick enough. Now, step therapy, uh, just to remind those how that works, it typically is seen uh, where a drug is very expensive, typically a name brand, that does have lesser expensive alternatives in its therapeutic category. So it's not that the insurance company doesn't cover that drug, it's just that they want the doctor to attempt a lower cost prescription prior to covering the higher cost prescription. 
So they have to go through and test out whether or not that, that generic works for the customer or not. Quantity limits, we see that in two places. On uh, controlled substances uh, that are, you know, uh, may say something like uh, they're only limited to 10 at any one time or very expensive drugs uh, where they may limit a 30 day you're not able to do a 90 day prescription um, on a drug that is uh, very expensive because they're worried about uh, loss through uh, theft or uh, misplacing and it's something that's just expensive so know that if you're looking something up now this one, this situation for me is only come up when somebody has moved. We're in one area of the country, a particular drug was very popular and they moved to another area of the country where that particular drug for that therapeutic category was not a popular uh, used item. Well, the uh, new plan during that first 90 days must cover a 30 day transition fill of that uh, prescription so that they uh, can provide the uh, customer enough time to see the doctor and get something new prescribed that would fill that, uh, uh, that need for them. And the other choice is to use the exception process where the doctor can do the paperwork to request an exception just know that when exceptions are granted they typically come in at tier four and that's that hundred dollar copay so uh, i wouldn't use an exception as my primary method uh, for trying to get a drug cover i would look at the transition and finding something that was in the formulary okay i want you to know that the uh, cms and the carriers use the secret shopper program uh, to make sure that uh, we are all doing things compliantly. And so typically what it, you'll get is somebody posing as an interested uh, person or party. Uh, and I've always been able to spot them when they uh, secret shopped myself uh, because they would say something along the lines of, I got your card from somebody on the airplane or I'm shopping for my mother or my aunt or my grandparent. And I want to, to look up some prescriptions to see if this plan covers it. And it usually starts off with, do you uh, handle United Healthcare? Or, you know, name your carrier. They already know that you do. And then uh, I'm thinking about this plan, but I want to know if these prescriptions are covered. And again, they're looking for you to look up the prescriptions, tell them whether or not they're covered, and if they are, whether there's any restrictions on there, like that prior authorization, step therapy, um, uh, quantity limits. They're, they're looking to make sure that you uh, say those things. Now, like I said, it can not only be from uh, CMS, but it can be done by the insurance carrier. And so uh, the best way to avoid any problems is you know the rules. I warned you ahead of time that they do it. And uh, so just, uh, you know, behave ethically and do the right thing. So some new changes that I want to highlight here. Uh, beginning on 1 October, and these will be for, uh, you know, open enrollment for plans starting on 1 January. Within the first minute, you have to give this disclosure, and I'll go over the disclosure here in a minute. And if it's over the telephone, um, the call has to be recorded. Okay. Um, I have used uh, many things in the past. I've done a lot of recordings over Zoom uh, and stored it on my hard drive. And then uh, there's some of the uh, carriers and some of things places like sunfire are uh, providing you with a, an ability to record on their platform that will again meet all the rules for uh, encrypting and, uh, and storage so uh, i always uh, i don't see the telephone uh, 
problem as being a real problem that is recorded. I've always recorded my calls. And uh, believe me, when uh, the complaint comes in, if you haven't got a complaint, you simply haven't been at Medicare long enough. Um, because it is so easy to provide a copy of the uh, you know, telephone transcript and our recording and uh, you know answer the question you know where uh, they said that their their complaint is the doctor's not in the network and you told them they were uh, with uh, an explanation along the lines of uh, you know, see the attached recording at minute 12, we discussed that the primary care physician, Dr. Smith, is not in the network, and that we looked up Dr. Jones and assigned Dr. Jones as a new primary care, and that the customer agreed to this, okay, and so that it's all there in the recording. It is so simple, uh, and the uh, complaint literally goes away as unfounded and is, uh, doesn't show up as a blemish on your record. Uh, this one is also a new requirement, that you make this statement. We do not offer every plan available in your area. Any information we provide is limited to those plans we do offer in your area. Please contact Medicare.gov or 1-800-MEDICARE to get information on all of your options. The way I normally would present uh, I mean, this is the, the first time on this particular disclaimer, but uh, having worked in call centers where we had other disclaimers, I would simply preamble it with, uh, let me get the government required uh, disc uh, you know, disclaimers out of the way and rattle that off and then move right on to whatever I have next without ever even skipping a beat. Uh, just so long as that is on that recording that you made the disclaimer, uh, you are fully covered. So to wrap things up, I just want you to follow the sales process and compliance process at all times. Like I said, you know, lay that down, go through that summary of benefits, because that is where the complaints are going to come from. Something came up that cost them money uh, that they did not expect because you didn't prepare them for it. So your most, uh, like I said, your most uh, valuable tool is to be sure that uh, is you're using your own integrity and desire to do the right thing. Um, and that will help you out. Always uh, use these rules. And I always say, use them to your advantage. I talk to the recording, knowing that it's there to protect me. Get that scope of appointment. And I can't overemphasize learning how to be able to uh, talk on the telephone and complete a scope of appointment at the same time with the beneficiary. Let that questions that they're asking about Medicare flow smoothly into a presentation and sale. And you can only do that uh, by being proficient and doing that scope of appointment over the phone. And when it comes to compliance, if you don't know, ask. Don't wing it. 